This is uh, opening for our fireside chat with Dr. Sherman James in honor of Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, uh, Kevin Dedner and Dr. Sherman James. Kevin Dedner serves as founder and CEO of Henry Health. Kevin brings over 15 years of experience in public health, having worked on a variety of issues, including childhood obesity, HIV and AIDS, to tobacco control, he has led strategic planning processes and facilitated convenings on behalf of several clients, including the nation's largest public health foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. A recovering political, Kevin has worked on polit political campaigns and successfully led health um, successfully left health policy wins. These days, Kevin is focusing on positioning Henry Health as a leader of culturally intentional mental health services and a moonshot goal of increasing the life expectancy of black men by 10 years within the next 25 years. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sherman A. James. Dr. Sherman A. James is a Susan B. King Emeritus Professor of Public Policy at the Stanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. He has also held professorship in sociology, community and family medicine, and African American epidemiology departments at the University of North, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and at the University of Michigan. At Michigan, he was the John P. Kirst Collegiate Professor of Public Health and the founding director of the Center for Research on Ethnicity, Culture, and Health, chair of the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education, and a senior research scientist and survey research center at the Institute of Social Research. Dr. James' research focuses on social determinants of race and ethnicity disparities in health and health care. He is the originator of John Henryism hypothesis, which, posit, which posits that repetitive high effort coping with difficult social and economic stressors is a major contributor to racial and social economic disparities and hypertension and related cardiovascular diseases. John Henry is an African-American folk hero he is said to have worked as a steel driving man who was tasked with hammering a steel drill into rock and to make holes for explosives during the construction of a railroad tunnel. According to the legend, John Henry's prowess as a steel driver was measured in a race against a machine. He won the race only to die in victory with a hammer in his hand as his heart gave out from stress. Tonight's fireside chat is hosted by Henry Health a company named in honor of Dr. James' John Henryism hypothesis. Henry Health is leading provider of culturally intentional mental health services. Before we begin, I would like to share a few housekeeping reminders. All attendees have been muted. Please remain on mute for the duration of the fireside chat. There will be time for questions at the end of the conversation. Attendees are welcome to use the chat feature to submit questions throughout the conversation. You may also use the raise hand feature during the question and answering period, and then unmute your microphone to ask your question. Well, with that said, I will pass the mic to uh, Mr. Kevin Dedner to get us started. Yeah, great. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate the uh, introduction. And um, I'm so delighted that so many of you have joined us tonight. And I'm super excited to introduce all of you all to Dr. Sherman James. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, um, I, I guess I could just say even ironic that we have Dr. James here this evening. He's sitting in my hometown in Little Rock, Arkansas, and um, so much of, of our work and our thinking is rooted in his research. And I was thinking about the conversation earlier today, and it reminded me of a conversation I had um, about two years ago with Dr. Tom Lavis, who is the Dean of the uh, College of Medicine at Tulane. And, and Dr. James, um, you know, Dr. Lavis said to me that there was a group of black men and you're included in, in that group who have sort of waited their entire career to see that their research be put into practice. And, and I was thinking about that and, and sort of the, this moment and how special this moment is that we're able to really take the lessons that you all have learned in, in the academic setting and try to put them into practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm elated to have you here. And I just want to start out the conversation by asking you, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic 
Um, the numbers continue to rise. So I want to just first check in and ask you, how are you doing? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Um, first, let me say how delighted I am to, um, to be a part of this fireside uh, chat. I thank you so much for, for making this possible. Uh, and as you indicated, I, I am sitting in, in my home in your hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, and um, so far, after, after four years of living here, it's, it's, been, it's been really quite, quite pleasant. Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, personally, I'm doing fine. Um, as you um, indicated in your in your question, uh, our country is facing um, a lot of challenges, um, and um, and certainly African Americans are are disproportionately burdened uh, by the by the, uh, the stresses caused by the pandemic. And I want to say that I think that the work that uh, Henry Health, under your leadership, um, is going to be extremely important, extremely important. It would be important even without the pandemic, but I think its, it's importance will be, will be even more um, given, given the challenges that, that we all are going to be facing, the physical and the mental health challenges that we're going to be facing uh, in, the, in the coming months, uh, years, and perhaps decades. So I just want to commend you and, and, your, and your group for launching this, this important uh, initiative. And um, I'm, just, I'm just incredibly thrilled and honored that my work um, actually had something to do with uh, how, you framed, how you framed your mission. So, yeah, and, and, and I, wanted, I want you to talk a little bit about how your work came to be, but I think for the purpose of the audience, I want to just really put in context to how I even discovered you. Um, it was a Saturday night and I was out with some friends and came home, turned on the television and learned of the uh, George Zimmerman verdict. Um, and I was so, literally just, just so upset and frustrated, I went to bed and woke up the next morning with like a, a terrible headache that literally lasted, you know, for uh, I'd say three days or so. And um, after my headache subdued, I started thinking about this really from an intellectual point, like could being a black man make me sick? Like it was literally a question I set out to answer. And that's how I discovered um, your work with my research um, um, colleague at the time, Dr. Ashley White Jones, she brought you know, your paper to us to me rather, and I was like, wow, this is so well documented. And, and I really felt, you know, honestly ashamed that I had spent my entire career in public health and had never really started to break down like the sociological pressures associated with, you know, the stress of, of just being um, a black man. So with that being said, why don't you tell the group um, or tell the audience a little bit of how um, the hypothesis even came to be. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give you what I hope is uh, the short version uh, of the story. Um, so I, I have a PhD in social psychology uh, from Washington University in St. Louis. And um, as I was finishing my, my doctorate, I um, received a phone call from the chair of the search committee at uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, the Department of Epidemiology, uh, asking me if I might be interested in coming down to Chapel Hill um, for a job interview in the epidemiology department. I had no idea what epidemiology was. Uh, but for, because I'm a South Carolinian, I'm a native South Carolinian, I thought, okay, I'll just go down and see what they have to say. And, and um, you know, I have stand nothing to lose if it turns out that um, you know, they're not interested in me really, and I'm not interested in them. Well, that turned out not to be the case. Um, I was fascinated by what I heard about the field of epidemiology and, and the focus that the Department of Epidemiology at Chapel Hill, uh, this is now the early 1970s, I should say, uh, the primary focus of the department in terms of its research and teaching mission uh, was like what differences in cardiovascular disease. 
And as I listened to people talk about the kind of work that they were doing, uh, the kind of teaching that we're doing, and the focus on, on the South, on Southern African Americans, and the epidemic of high blood pressure and stroke, and at the time it was really high blood pressure and stroke, much, much less heart disease. I said, oh, this is really very interesting. So I took, I took the leap uh, and accepted the offer when they made it a few weeks later, and um, sort of um, cast around um, aimlessly for a few years, um, trying to find my footing as a social psychologist uh, in a department of epidemiology surrounded by parasitologists, virologists. We all know a whole lot more about virologists now, given the, given the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, but um, after about five years, uh, the department uh, got a grant, a fairly large grant from the National Institutes of Health to do a big um, intervention study um, on high blood pressure control in the eastern part of the state of North Carolina, where there's a lot of cardiovascular disease, uh, morbidity and mortality, particularly in the African-American population. And the primary focus of the, of the NIH grant, it was a five-year grant, the primary focus was going to be uh, trying to do something about controlling high blood pressure in black men. But nobody had any idea really about, you know, how you approach this. So I volunteered to um, interview some black men with hypertension to get their stories, uh, to try to learn their perspective so that we could um, uh, go about this work, go about uh, designing the intervention uh, in a way that would be grounded to some degree at least in their life experiences. Well, the first man that I spoke to, uh, the interview, I had five interviews lined up uh, by a, a physician colleague who was a primary care physician and in a rural community just north of Chapel Hill, the very first man that I spoke to was a man named John Martin. I did not know his middle name. Um, so I drove out to, to visit with him uh, one hot, sticky uh, July afternoon, 1978. And um, he was waiting for me in his backyard, inviting me to sit down and talk. And I just started asking him about his life. I learned that he, um, he had been a, a farmer for all of his life. He was born in, in a sharecropping family, um, born in 1907, uh, so very early in the 20th century, in a sharecropping family, very, very poor, dirt poor. Uh, his father had been a sharecropper all of his life. His grandfather had been a sharecropper all of his life. His grandfather was probably a slave, uh, uh, an emancipated slave. And so they, you know, when he uh, was emancipated, he became a sharecropper and his son became a sharecropper and uh, Mr. John Martin was born into the sharecropping family. But as he grew up, he decided that he did not want to be a sharecropper all of his life like his father and, and have his uh, labor exploited, have him to give uh, over half of his income to the man who owned the land. He was outraged by this kind of, of exploitation of his labor. So with the very strong encouragement of his wife, uh, he took out a 40 uh, acre, 40 year mortgage from a bank um, to purchase 75 acres of reasonably fertile farmland. But he didn't want to be indebted for 40 years. And so he decided he was going to try to pay it off in one year. Well, he worked night and day uh, with a lot of help from his wife and, um, and his small children. And he paid off that farm in five years, paid every cent in five years, even though he had 40 years to pay for it. And so he said to me, uh, I think that's the reason why my, my legs are all out of whack now. He had a case of debilitating osteoarthritis and barely walk. And then I, of course, I knew that he had high blood pressure, but I didn't know that he had debilitating osteoarthritis. And he also told me that he had a case of peptic ulcers disease uh, about 15 years before then that was so severe that he had to have 40% 40, uh, 40 of his stomach surgically removed. So he had these three sort of almost classic stress-related disorders, high blood pressure, peptic ulcers, 
and uh, osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis. And around that time, uh, we've been talking, or he'd been talking, and I've been, I was listening, he'd been talking for maybe an hour straight. And his wife came to the door and she said, John Henry, uh, it's time for lunch and bring your, bring your guests with you. So I looked at him, astonished, and I said, your name is John Henry? He said, yes, John Henry Martin. And I thought, holy cow, this man's name is John Henry Martin. John Henry, as in John Henry, the steel driving man. And so then I began to think, hmm, John Henry, his story of having to go up against the machine was analogous, that is to say John Henry, um, John Henry, the steel driving man, went up against the machine. So here was John Henry Martin who went up against the sharecropping machine and he won. He actually became uh, an independent farmer, but he paid a high price in terms of his health for having been victorious uh, over the machine. And as I reflected on his life story, Mr. Martin's life story, I realized that his story was really the story of African-American people. Uh, even though he was a farmer and he went up against the machine, he worked very hard against, uh, to overcome enormous odds. And he had, these, he had these health problems. And so I began to think about my own family, uh, my mom, my dad, my uncles, my aunts, all of them had high blood pressure. And as I thought about John Henry Martin's life, I realized that my aunts and uncles and my mom and my dad all worked just like that. And they all had high blood pressure. And I said, well, there's something bigger here. There's a bigger story here. And that's sort of kind of the seed of you know, the concept of John Henryism, um, that African-Americans, uh, particularly working class African-Americans, are caught in what I caught up in what I call a John Henryism situation, where they have to grow up against a machine in order to survive, uh, in order to in order to move forward in life, and sometimes just to survive, literally yeah, yeah. sometimes working themselves to death. So uh, then it became a question of okay, how do I study this? And um, and then I I set about developing. Uh, the John Henryism scale, which consists of 12 questions. Um, and this is where my background as a social psychologist came into play. I was able to, to then sort of find my way in this, in this field of epidemiology and I became, I became a social epidemiologist. So, so basically that's the, that's the background of how I, yeah, how yeah. I sort of stumbled upon the concept yeah, yeah. of John Henryism and began to develop uh, the hypothesis of John Henry's hypothesis. Yeah, you know what's interesting is when we were thinking very early about what to name our company, we did focus groups with black men. And one of the icebreakers in the focus group was, tell us the name of a black man in your life who has been synonymous with what it means to be a strong man. And the most common name that was mentioned was John Henry, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's funny because when we were thinking about how to name the company, we put that back in front of the group. And there are those of us who had like the public health background, we knew the backstory of John Henry, but there are other people who did not know it. And so when we finally as a team landed on the, the name, we were like, oh, we have something much more powerful. And in, in many ways, as I hear you tell that story, I feel like um, sort of the, the spirit of, of men who have toiled and worked so very hard, like their spirits are speaking out saying to us, you know, we really need to address this problem. So I appreciate you sharing that. I, I wanna ask you when, you, when you think about the hypothesis and you think about everything that's going on today, how relevant is the John Henryism hypothesis today? Well, I think it, it continues uh, to be relevant um, because metaphorically, um, the machine changes its face uh, over, over time. It doesn't stay the same. Uh, the first really big machine was slavery. The next one was Jim Crow, uh, the convict labor system, sharecropping. Those were machines, those were e sort of economic machines, if you will, uh, which, uh, into which African-Americans were sort of inserted and exploited. And, um, and uh, with every advance, with every advance, with every 
every stride forward, the machine changes its face. There's always a, back, a backlash. And we, we're sort of experiencing that, that backlash uh, today. Um, we, we, we made some advances in terms of, for example, voting rights. And as soon as the opportunity came along to, to vitiate the voting rights uh, bill, to, to, um, to disempower uh, or to reduce the, the power, the political power of black folks, all of these uh, mechanisms, these, these laws, these regula regulations, these public policies have as their, their goal, really the subjugation and the, and the subordination of African Americans, right, and right. and we see then that African Americans are now really on the front line, along with uh, along with Latinos, in these uh, low wage, essential working jobs, and and many of them, particularly African Americans, and to also a significant degree, are Latinos. By the time that they're in their uh, late thirties and, and early forties, they already have high blood pressure. Right. or diabetes, for the reasons that I alluded to when I was describing what John Henryism is and sort of where it comes from. Uh, and, it, and, and the wear and tear on, on multiple physiological systems from just battling the machine, from just having to work very hard and to be underpaid and to put up with all kinds of, of, of disrespect and, and denigration and humiliation and exploitation, these things take their toll. And yet, and yet people have to persist. They can't afford to give up. And so the wear and tear associated with this arduous struggle to be successful uh, in life in the face of this, these big economic and, and cultural and political stressors puts people at risk for having high blood pressure, having diabetes, and it makes them that much more susceptible, as we know, to the ravages of the COVID-19 uh, virus. So, so we, we hear a lot in the news today about, oh yes, one of the reasons why African-Americans, Latinos are, are at greater risk of, of suffering the more severe consequences of COVID-19 and dying disproportionately from them because, because they have, they're, they're more likely to have high blood pressure and diabetes. Yeah, but where does that come from? Where does that mm -hmm. come from, right? So um, I think it's incredibly relevant and because the economic, uh, stressors resulting from the pandemic, those economic stressors are going to last for quite a while longer, and they're going to have a disproportionate impact on the African American and the Latino population. And yet those individuals, those people who are caught up in this kind of John Anderson situation, are going to have to persist. They're going to have to find a way uh, to make a living for themselves, uh, right. right? Even though jobs are Jobs are, are not as plentiful as they need to be. The economic security is not what it should be. The social safety nets are not what they should be. So it's, it's, it's really quite, quite relevant still. Let me, let me try to move the conversation pretty fast. And I want to try to do two things in, in this next round of questions. But I also just want to say for context that we have been talking to um, the last um, really two, three weeks after the death of George Floyd we have had like very um, honest conversations with health systems and health payers. And I think that we've reached a more honest conversation about health disparities than we've ever seen, certainly than I've ever seen in my career. Um, for example, I was on a phone a few days ago with the director of innovation of a major payer, and he was literally righteously angry about black women having um, the highest infant mortality rates, even when we add the controls of higher education and higher income. So I do think that we're having a much, much more honest conversation about these things than we've ever had, which leads me to, I really want to try to make sure that we broaden this conversation and include um, black women in this conversation. And so, you know, I came across in preparing for this conversation um, a, a paper written by Dr. Cheryl Woods Gliscom about the superwoman uh, schema uh, for African American women. And I wanted to, for us, as we set this conversation, I want to ask in two ways. Number one, I want to I want to ask you how does this superwoman um, concept compare to the John Henryism construct? 
but also I just want to frame it as the superwoman concept is also what we commonly refer to as the strong black woman um, construct. Uh, and then after you address that, I want you to just be very, very blunt about the impact of racism on the health of black Americans and not only our physical health, but even draw some comparisons to when we think of the concept of wealth, of health rather, our whole health, like our mind, our body, and our spirit, like what, what that racism does to us. Okay, well, with respect to um, the first question uh, having to do with um, the strong black woman or the um, superwoman schema, I think is the way that the originator of the uh, strong black woman uh, construct has sort of broadened it, um, and John Henryism. I think that I think that they're tapping into the same phenomenon. Um, as you know now from my uh, opening uh, comments, um, I developed the John Henderson construct in the late 1970s, very early 1980s. My first paper was published in 1983. And the superwoman construct or the strong black woman construct, even though um, writers, feminist writers had been sort of writing about uh, the strong black women for, woman for, for decades. It really wasn't until maybe the last maybe decade or so that uh, health researchers, particularly African-American health researchers, uh, such as the, the originator, uh, was Gilson, what, what's the name, Kevin? Uh, Glisson. Yeah. Dr. Glisson. Glisson. Right, so I think it's within the last 10 years or so that health researchers have begun to uh, try to conceptualize uh, this construct of, of the superwoman, super black, the strong black woman, in ways that that could be related to health, could be studied from a health point of view. Um, but but the two constructs really tap into the same underlying phenomenon: um, the wear and tear on African Americans, whether they're males or whether they're females, uh, that results from just trying to live your life with, with dignity, to try to be successful uh, in the face of these enormous stressors. Racism, in the case of, of, uh, of, of black men, racism and sexism in the case, in, in the case of black women. So I think it's, I think it's a, a step forward that, um, that, uh, that African-American women researchers are now beginning to uh, specify what this, um, what this phenomenon of, of having to struggle against great odds uh, looks like uh, specifically for black women in a way that doesn't apply uh, in quite the same way to black men. So I think it's really a, I think it's really a step forward. I think at, at bottom, they really are talking about, about the same phenomenon of the physiological wear and tear on multiple organ systems that just result from having to struggle against systemic stressors, poverty, racism, sexism, year in, year out, decade in, decade out, and what that can do uh, to, your, to your physical health. Now, with respect to the broader concept of health and well-being, uh, my work, uh, Kevin, has, as you know, has focused primarily on, on cardiovascular disease. I have not specifically looked at, at mental health but other people have looked at the relationship between say, John Henryism and some aspects of psychological health. Here's what we know briefly, uh, that high scores on John Henryism, on the scale of John Henryism that I measured, high scores tend to correlate with very good psychological health. Low scores tend to correlate with less uh, psychological well-being, higher risk of depression, higher levels of anxiety, um, fearfulness. So, um, so the way I think about it, um, as, long as, as long as you're reasonably successful in terms of your striving, in terms of moving ahead, as long as you can sort of hang in there through being high on John Hinduism, your mental health is going to be reasonably good. Reasonably good. At least you're going to, re you're going to present yourself as having uh, pretty good health. But that psychological well-being may be a very fragile kind of thing. Uh, over time, 
uh, particularly if you, you know, if you run into serious difficulty, if you suffer, suffer serious losses like a job loss or, or the death of a, of, a, of a spouse or death of a child or uh, any kind of major setback, that, that could actually cause you to, you know, to be less resilient, to have less energy to, to move forward and to be more, to be more susceptible to developing uh, depression. So, so I think then that as long as people are able to move forward, able to hang in there, have enough sort of, have enough resources that, that they can mobilize uh, to stay in the game from a psychological point of view, they're going to look not too bad, but that, mm -hmm. but that psychological good, good health might be a very fragile kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, but then when they become overwhelmed by the stressors, then, that, then that's going to increase their likelihood um, of, of becoming uh, depressed. Right. And and just as a, a time check, we're going to open it up for questions here in a, a little over five minutes. So I want to just encourage the audience to begin to drop questions in the chat. You can also use your um, raise your hand feature and ask your question live. I'll take you off mute. Um, you, you know, Dr. James, um, our thesis is that if we can teach people uh, and provide tools to help people manage their stress and anxiety in uh, a, a better way that we can reverse um, these poor health outcomes and we can even have improved mental health outcomes. So that is like the core of our theses at Henry Health. And, and to just like to make, take a point of personal privilege um, for me, in my career, I made the decision that a lot of people were focused on trying to make the systems work better, but very few people were focused on how to help our people live longer and better lives. So I've made the decision to devote the rest of my career to how do I increase my friend's life expectancy, right, as opposed to fighting and wrestling with the systems that wear us down. So I, I guess to frame the question, I really want to ask you, when you think about the John Henryism construct and the superwoman schema, what practical advice do you have, or, or even just from your research, how do we even begin to uh, prevent this uh, in addition to solutions like Henry Health, because I do believe that, you know, that is like part of what we need to do is to help people learn, learn to deal with this stress and anxiety in a different way. Now, let me also just say as a full disclaimer, I'm certainly not suggesting that people should not be doing the equity and justice work, but I, I am want to be very blunt that people are dying and living much shorter lives than they should because of the inability to manage the stress and anxiety moving through life. I could not agree with you more. Um, and I, I take your, your point um, very, uh, I take your point to heart that um, if we're going to reduce um, racial, by which I mean in this case, uh, like white uh, health disparities or black, uh, Asian American health disparities, because those are real as well. If we're going to improve the health and well being of African Americans, um, increase life expectancy, uh, in, improve quality of life, we're going to have to work on multiple levels. We're going to have to work on the policy level, and we're going to have to work on the level of individual interventions, uh, mental health interventions. So I completely agree with you. I also agree with you, Kevin that um, the shortage of, of uh, culturally competent uh, mental uh, health uh, professionals uh, who are African-American is a serious problem. It's a serious problem. Finding, finding, a, um, finding, a, finding therapists who know, who know what questions to ask. This is not to say that, that non-Black uh, therapists uh, can be very effective. And, and working with African-American clients. Some can be quite effective, 
but it, it takes a long time for many of them to sort of learn how to ask the right questions, to even put themselves uh, in the shoes uh, of African Americans, which is a very hard thing to do, and it may never it may never happen uh, as fully as it needs to happen. So when you have um, when you have a match, when you have racial concordance in terms of the therapist and the client, already you have built in uh, you have built you you have built into that into that relationship. Uh, an understanding on the part of the therapist of what that patient's life is like, what that individual's life is like. And so from the very outset, uh, the therapist is going to know what kinds of questions to ask and how to read the responses. The trust level is likely to be there uh, uh, more quickly uh, as well. So I think that, um, I think that, that, um, that helping, uh, helping African-American uh, clients, whether they're male or female, learn how to manage the endemic stressors that, that they're going to be confronting in their environment and learning new strategies, uh, more effective strategies for dealing with those stresses is incredibly important. Whether it's going to result in improving uh, life, increasing life expectancy uh, by 10 years and 25 years is, is how I think you put it, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know, but I think that's a goal worth 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 striving for. Uh, yeah. And even if, pardon? No, no. I was just gonna I was gonna say that we know that these deaths are being caused by chronic diseases. That if we were able to help people manage their lifestyles, yeah. uh, make more healthy decisions, that we could move those markers that are causing these chronic diseases, right? So, so, so part of this thinking is that mental health, self-awareness is like this first requirement to making better health decisions. And, it's, and, and, and what's fascinating is that we, I've been having these conversations the last couple um, weeks with payers and, and I think that we've, we've reached a turning point in this country that we're talking about health in a more honest and candid way. I think that we've had these sort of polite conversations like we have in the South that we know that we have a problem, but we don't really call it out. Uh, but now we're being a lot more honest. And, and I think that this is a real opportunity um, to elevate like your work and so many others who sort of put, you know, you, you, you've done the work, you, you, you have the research sitting on the shelves that we can now put into practice. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. We're, we're at this point now that we want to start to uh, open it up for questions from the audience. Um, feel free to drop your audience, your questions in the chat box, or if you raise your hand, I will take you off of mute, um, or Tony will take you off of mute. When you ask your question, let it be a question tell your name and where you're from and if you're representing an organization as well. And I see, Tony, we have a first question with Oki, if you can take him off of mute. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Brother Detner, for your support, Brother Spang. Good, good to see you. Dr. James, I am starstruck. <laughs> um, um, my name is O.K. Enya. I am getting a doctorate in health policy um, where my work is centered on further exploring the intersections of race, gender, equity, health, and policy as it relates to the lived experiences of Black men and boys over life course. And so I, in the course, uh, and I am in the dissertation proposal drafting stage, and I have a few research questions that I have been pondering and, and, and that I am working with a few mentors on and so this conversation is, is very telling because I think it'll further inform my, my work. And my focus is gonna be on um, black men and their heart health. Um, and looking at, at the very, looking at uh, certain, um, certain biomarkers to, in terms of measuring kind of uh, stress. And so I've, I've cited you as well in my work, and I, my question is, what do you envision, as I kind of lean into this work and I 
get will get out into the field as a scholar activist and as a policymaker because I'm, I'm also a former House and Senate staffer on Capitol Hill here in D.C. What do you envision, or maybe it's, it's, it's to our question one: What would be some perhaps some language or some about in terms of a question that I could potentially frame, or two? What do you envision will be the frontier in terms of the next kind of iteration of the John Henry um, construct? Or how should I start to kind of think about what that next step should be so I can potentially include that content, that context in my work right now? Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for joining us and thank you for, for your question. Uh, two things come to mind. Uh, one, uh, to refer back to uh, Kevin's very last comment about um, sort of the mental health implications of, of this. I think that, I think that uh, understanding the, the mental health consequences of, of, of an arduous struggle uh, to be successful in the face of racism or racism and sexism um, even, even though you might be successful, there are a lot of, as you well know, uh, you're in a PhD program and, and you know that, at least I know from my own personal experience, you know, the higher you get, uh, oftentimes, you know, the, that's when those unique stressors sort of kick in. The closer you get to, you know, to competing for positions of authority and influence in these institutional settings, you know, that's when that's when those opportunities, that's when those stressors begin to sort of impinge upon you, oftentimes in very subtle, in very subtle ways. And that can induce, you know, that can be very frustrating, but it can, it can go beyond just sort of being frustrating. It can be, it can make you very angry. It can, it can cause you to sort of question yourself. And for some people, it, it causes them to give up, you know, on, on their aspirations. Um, and then if you persist, if you persist and, and you don't take care of yourself in the process, you double down, you say, I have to work twice as hard as everybody else. I have to take work home with me at night, work on weekends. You put all this enormous pressure on yourself. Well, what are the physiological and the psychological costs uh, of that? So I think that, I think that we need to understand uh, better than we do today based on the research that I've done, you know, what are both the mental health and the physical health consequences of this? Why is it that with uh, higher levels of educational and occupational achievement, African Americans don't get the same kind of positive health return that their white colleagues get, right? So we need to really kind of move up. I'd like to see future research move up the, the socioeconomic scale and begin to take a closer look at what's happening with high achieving African Americans. That's one direction. And the other direction that I think uh, could benefit from um, more research has to do with uh, black boys, uh, black boys and black girls. But since your question had to do with boys, I'm going to say black boys. Based on what we know from, from the literature uh, already uh, in hand, uh, this process of the deterioration of cardiovascular health begins very early, begins very early in life, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11 years of age. Uh, black boys, of course, you know, they stop being cute after about age eight or nine or 10. Uh, and the larger society uh, uh, re acts toward them as if they're a lot older than they really are. So they don't have a chance to really be children. And, um, and if they have any kind of size, any kind of you know, physical size, you know, they immediately become threatening. So these are enormous stressors that can have, um, have an impact very early on in terms of the cardiovascular health, uh, particularly of black boys, not exclusively black boys, but since we're talking about boys and men, just gonna focus on males for the moment. So that by the time black males enter their, their late teens and early 20s, they're already on this very fast trajectory uh, to develop uh, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, uh, quite early in life. So any kind of intervention that we do with black males to really be, to really uh, have a, a, an important prevention impact to really improve life expectancy, we're gonna have to start young. We're gonna have to start early. We're gonna have to start with, with pre-adolescent black boys 
because if you wait until they're in their 20s or 30s or 40s and they're coming in for psychotherapy, that's too late. The opportunity to really have an impact on their quality of life, on their elevated risk for high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, the opportunity to have a major impact uh, is really early, pre-teens, not, not young adulthood. Yeah. So those are, the, those are my, two, my two responses. Great. I just want to remind the audience that they can raise their hand or drop questions in the chat box. I do have a question that just came in the chat box that I want to read that came to me directly. But Dr. James, you just said something that really uh, resonated with me about young people. And I think, you know, I'm raising three children. My oldest is 14. And one of the things that I was taught or told growing up is that I had to be twice as good as the next person. And, in, and so, you know, with my children, I don't use language like that. I sort of tell them, all I want is your best. And if, if your best uh, it gets us a C, I'll take the C. If your best gets me a D, I'll take the D. But I, I wonder if you could just push there a little and think about are there ways that even we as African Americans perpetuate the superwoman construct and even the John Henryism construct just by sort of adopting things like being twice as good and so forth? Yeah, I think that that's right. Uh, and I think that we should stop giving our, our children those messages. Um, and I think that a more appropriate message, a healthier message is, um, it's exactly what you said, you know, do your best. And as long as you're doing your best, you know, I'm gonna be happy with you, uh, you know, as a child, as long as you are doing your best. You don't have to work twice as hard as other people. Uh, you're gonna make, make time for play, make time for relaxation. Um, and I also think that, that uh, black parents can also model, in fact, what you model for your children in terms of how to live a healthy life, may be much more powerful in terms of how they are socialized about how to be black in the world than anything that you might say, because they're, they're observing you, they're looking at you, and they're gonna pattern, uh, if they love you and admire you, and, and for, you know, for most of us, that's gonna be the case, they're gonna be looking up to you, they're gonna be patterning themselves after you. So we need to model, we need to model healthy behavior, we need to, we need to play, we need to laugh, we need to take time to relax, you know, to strike a, a, a good balance for our, and model striking a good balance for our children in terms of work, play. And do I think that we have done as good a job as we, we should have or could have in previous generations? No, I don't, think that we, I don't think that we have. I think that we can do much better. So yes, yeah, so those messages, uh, you know, revising the messages that we tell our children about, about how to go about being successful in life, the importance of pacing yourself, the importance of taking time out to relax, to enjoy life, to enjoy life. That is so important. Right, great. Thank you for that. Tony, I believe you have a question. I do. I have a question from Anika Warren. Uh, Anika says, hi. This is Nika Warren. I work at Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. I'd love to hear Dr. Jane's perspective on how we get more black uh, people informed and committed to improving their own health and mental well um, health outcomes. Well, that is a good, that is a very good question. I think that, um, I think that, that webinars like, like this uh, help, uh, help a lot. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so, I was telling my wife just the other day that, you know, uh, one of the upsides of having to stay at home uh, and, and going online for, for, edu for educational purposes and, you know, interesting intellectual exchanges really, it's been good. I have, I have personally learned a great deal uh, and I'm learning a lot from, you know, from, from your questions. So I think that, that this format is, is a wonderful educational tool that, that we, we should exploit. Um, to achieve the, uh, the goal that, that, that was um, raised uh, in the question. I also think that we can use, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Cub Scout granddad, for example. <laughs> uh, we have a, a nine-year-old uh, 
boy uh, here in Little Rock, which is why, why we, I'm a wife and I retired from Little Rock. And so I take, before the, before the shutdown, I, I would take uh, the nine-year-old to, to Cub Scout meetings uh, every couple of weeks. So, so here's, a, here's another opportunity, right, to talk to black boys about, um, about uh, health and well-being and, and what success looks like and career kinds of opportunities, uh, including opportunities uh, in, the mental health, in the mental health field. So we need to go where the folks are. We need to go where people are and not, not just rely on, you know, on the you know, traditional sort of educational uh, uh, venues, for example, school, whether it's college or graduate school, but churches, um, sororities, uh, wherever young people are. Wherever young people are, wherever black folks are, let's let's do a better job than we have been doing uh, up until now in terms of putting putting these ideas out there, starting conversations, and also letting you know sharing information that we have about where the resources are in the community uh, for living well, um, and and you know yeah for living well. So so yes, I, I think that I, as Kevin said a moment ago, I think that that we have a we're, we're all in a moment now where people across racial ethnic and social class lines are beginning to ask different kinds of questions are beginning to ask questions about well what really counts what really matters what's really important in life yeah this is one of the things that the pandemic has 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 caused us to do is to start asking really fundamental questions and so this is an opening and um and it's an opening to talk about uh, how we achieve better health and well-being um, in the case of African Americans or in the case of any other group that has been marginalized and disadvantaged. Great. I just want to pause and see if there are any more questions from the audience. Just raise your hand uh, and we'll take you off of mute to ask your questions. Any more questions? That being said, um, Dr. James, I, I just kind of want to maybe pause before we begin to wrap up this conversation and ask, um, was there anything that you came hoping to share tonight that you did not have the opportunity to share? Um, well, uh, you were kind enough to uh, uh, send me a few questions uh, to think about uh, before the before the webinar, and one of the questions I thought was was really uh, very important. You asked uh, when I think about the future, what what concerns me the most, and um, and I thought, well, I thought two things. Uh, a long term concern is. Um, is climate change or global warming. Because unless we do something about that, unless we find a way to, to um, make the planet uh, continue to be a habitable place for children and grandchildren, future generations to come, nothing else matters. So I worry about, I worry about global warming. And I worry about global warming, I mean, for, the, for, for our species, but because all the evidence suggests that the, um, the earliest and the greatest impact would be on poor people, whether they're here in the US or whether they're elsewhere in the world. So I worry about that in terms of, of a long-term concern. Short term, uh, I worry about growing racial and, um, about racial and, and wealth inequality uh, because of the way that our how our economy is structured, the way that our society uh, is structured. Um, uh, the, the growth in, in income and wealth has really been concentrated in the hands of a fairly small sliver of people. And that kind of thing um, erodes, erodes democracy and it, it engenders social and political instability. I worry about that. And then you get, you know, you get the demagogues who will, 
uh, start scapegoating uh, uh, people of color, African Americans specifically, uh, because because a large and uh, an increasingly large sec segment of the white population uh, feels that it it has fallen behind, that is it is losing. So I worry about. I worry about uh, growing racial and wealth inequality. And I also worry, and this is a second uh, sort of shorter term uh, concern, I worry about, about the impact, the ongoing impact of anti-Black racism uh, on African-Americans, particularly on, on Black youth. Um, and you know, three years ago, three, three and a half years ago, um, my grandchildren, um, knew of only one president, and that president was Black. Uh, and having, uh, having this amazing Black family in the White House was, was exhilarating. I mean, it, it, it said so much to them about what their lives as Americans could be. Um, it was empowering. And now we're in the situation where you have all, have all of this really toxic rhetoric uh, coming from the highest office uh, in the land, and and public policies that um, are disempower designed to disempower people, designed to to weaken even more the the social safety net of people who are economically vulnerable, and of course you have the you have the police killings of, of unarmed black people. So I worry about you know. And because and because of social media, you can't we can't protect our black children from this kind of news in, in ways that, for example, I was protected uh, from the worst kind of news as a as a black boy growing up in the South in the in the 1950s. We didn't have social media, we didn't have television, uh, and so we were sort of protected. But now our black children, our black youth, are not protected from from these sort of toxic um, messages, uh, these toxic acts. And so I worry about what this is doing uh, to them, um, and 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 I hope that I, I hope that you know we can turn the corner uh, in terms of this political environment, and and get back on the uh, on the on the track that I think that the you know that the Obama administration um, tried to set us tried to set us on. So those are those are some of the things that you know I can't let you. In, end it like that. You, now you have to tell me what you're optimistic about. Okay. Well, I am optimistic. I'm optimistic about um, the uh, what appears to be a very powerful uh, multiracial coalition um, to um, to fight um, structural racism uh, in our in our country. It's not just our country. It's global. So I am optimistic about about uh, the fact that uh, more and more non-black people in this country and around the world uh, are are um, stepping forward uh, and taking a stand, saying that, you know, challenging um, uh, structural racism, systemic racism, and the way that it undermines the health and well-being of people of color, particularly African Americans. This is new. And it's, and it's even different from the 1960s. I was a college student in the early 1960s. It's even different from the early 1960s. That was also a, a sort of a bright moment in the midst of all of the, all of the you know the harm and the pain and the suffering and sacrifice that characterized that era and that made that made that made made progress uh, possible. But this feels different. Uh, we have more. There are more non-black allies now who are willing to take a stand to put their bodies on the line uh, to bring about systemic change. That gives me enormous hope. Uh, so, so yes, uh, I, would, I, would, I would add that. I, I join you in that hope. And, and as we wrap up, I just, I, I was, as I mentioned, I was reflecting on a meeting I had, uh, Tony was actually there with me about two years ago. We sat down with Thomas Levis. And, you know, we were sort of telling him about what we wanted to work on and he stopped us and he said, you know, we've been, there are a group of us who've been waiting for the last 30, 40 years to have these conversations publicly about our work. 
And, you know, I, I just want to tell you from a, as a point of personal privilege, I am incredibly humbled by the work that you've done and what you've committed your career to. And, and I see our work as an extension of, of, of your work. And, and, I, and I am so um, incredibly proud to you know, have this opportunity to, to be associated with you and to really make real what, what you and Thomas Levis and Woody Neighbors mm-hmm. have devoted your entire careers to. And I hope that that from our work that you can draw some contentment that that your work has not been in vain. So I just want to thank you, and I, I literally mean that from the the very bottom of my heart. And I'll turn it back over to Tony from here. Well, as I echo Kevin, uh, Dr. Sherman James, uh, it has been a pleasure. And as we are seeing in the chat box. Um, that everybody else is, is saying the same. And so what we want to do is just acknowledge you, we honor you, and we thank you for everything that you have done for paving the way for us, and we will continue to champion that going forward. What we also will do right now is we want to share a video um, with everybody. It's, it's a video that we've created, and I think it'll also send a bright message on what we want to do as we soldier forward into the future. Close your eyes. Imagine a world where we can all show up whole, operate with joy, and live with power. Envision a world where systemic racism, police brutality, and white supremacy are distant memories. Now open your eyes. How are we going to create that future? Our freedom and liberation are directly connected to our neighbors, and in that spirit, We honor the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others who have died in the hands of law enforcement. To those who are experiencing trauma, we see you. For those who protest with righteous anger, we hear you. Our first community was designed by and for Black men because we have long understood the emotional weight that Black men carry every day. Like Dr. King, we understand the language of the unheard. We understand you. Our therapy services are designed specifically to provide a safe space for people from diverse backgrounds to engage in healing conversations that acknowledge systemic oppression. From our founding, we have been committed to dismantling structural racism and the detrimental effects it has on our mental health and well-being. Now, more than ever, we remain true to this work. We are Henry Health, and we are here to help. As we've shown that video, and I hope it's also enlightened and brought some more feelings of knowing that we will charge forward and continue to make change in our world that we live in, I want to say thank you again, Dr. Sherman Jane, for being here and paving the way for us. And I want to thank you all for being here and being present and listening to how Kevin Dedner has gone through a fireside chat that allowed it an intimate moment for us to listen and and hear. Um, At this point, this has been recorded and we all ask that, you know, uh, because you've had your video off, that was permission or allowing us permission to do so. And so what we will do is have this available at another time. But again, uh, thank you, Dr. Sherman James, and thank you, uh, Kevin Dedner, for leading us through this uh, fireside chat. Thank you all and you all have a good night.